I said that the R6A district is the one that's currently uh, under review and uh, under approval. So you can see from the uh, photos provided of the site, this site is a uh, small two-story warehouse building on the upper right portion. It's that central building right there. It is adjacent to a two-story commercial building with a ground floor Chase Bank. And adjacent to that on the other side of the parcel, it, as you can see to the left on the lower left slide, is a three-story building. This building has ground floor commercial with two floors of residential use above. So in the existing M11 district, that third building is non-conforming. We also note that it is vacant. Uh, this has proved to be somewhat of a challenging site for development and for uh, sustaining any long-term tenants, as you can see from the uh, following slides. So here's kind of a, a picture of the outlook of the site. The site uh, looks onto an M11 and M21 area with many commercial buildings. You'll notice the fan plant, uh, rather tall structure, uh, comparable to an R6A in height uh, above the entrance or the, the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Um, so really what you have here is you have a site which fronts out onto Hamilton Avenue and Summit Street. The uh, City Planning Commission found that this provided an extra wide area. So while the R6B is most definitely customary and appropriate for mid-block properties. They felt that uh, in the initial analysis, an R7A was appropriate for a much wider expanse, and in the ultimate analysis, that an R6A was appropriate, given the fact that you are really more along a wide street than you are along a narrow side street. Additional pictures basically demonstrate uh, what this site looks out onto. Again, the confluence of these three streets here provide an extra wide street, as well as basically looking out onto manufacturing and commercial properties. So we'll note that what are we left with at the end of the day? We're left with the five-story building. Uh, this is a five-story building with five units. Um, the uh, owner here has been in the area for a number of years, um, has um, owned this property for a number of years, and so has re is really seeking to change the zoning from an M11 to an R6A for several reasons. One of those is that as an M11 on a block with residential, you are still permitted to do commercial and light manufacturing uses. So uh, it does really nobody any good to be a residential neighbor of an M11 district. Uh, you are allowed to use um, auto-related uses. There is light manufacturing that's available. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't make sense to have a, a heavily commercial property not only of this property, but of the two adjacent parcels, to be allowed to locate heavy, toxic commercial uses as of right next to both residential uses as well as to a community garden. Uh, they, they would be able to go into department of buildings as of right and essentially locate what would amount to be on the entirety of the parcel a 24,000 square foot commercial building with ground floor commercial and manufacturing if they so chose. This is not something which is desired. It's desired to do a residential property which is much more contiguous uh, with the context of the area. We know that there's been a lot of information with regards to this project, particularly in the newspapers, including uh, Brooklyner, and we note that the rendering that is used in those projects has a seven to eight story building. This is no longer the case. Uh, the case now is what you see before you. It is a five-story building. Uh, what, what would we note about this height? This is an R6A building. Uh, despite the fact that many people ask for R6B, the height of this building is indeed an R6B height and an R6A bulk. Uh, R6A floor area abides here. One of the reasons for that is that this R6A district is next to an R6B district. And so they cannot use an unbridled 80-foot uh, height limit uh, for the R6A, or actually 70 feet with a, uh, with, um, uh, without man uh, mandatory inclusionary housing. Instead, they are required to limit their height to 55 feet. So this is the actual building that would be produced. We note that the R6B permits a 50-foot height as well. Um, so this application is about certain things. It's about the ability to do residential in a district where now only manufacturing exists. It's about the ability to add a number of units to this local area. It's not about the height of this building. This building is comparable to an R6B height and would remain so. Uh, it's also not about the total number of units. There are individuals who provided testimony at the City Planning Commission with regards to their fears with regards to the number of units that would now be entering this area. The truth is that this building right here has five units. At a maximum density factor of 680 for an R6A, they would be able to put in seven units. What do we note from the entirety of the rezoning area? The entirety of the rezoning area under an R6A would be allowed to do 25 units 
with these five units, 30 units. Under an R6B, they would be allowed to do 26 units, uh, inclusive of the seven units permitted at this site. So literally the difference between the R6B and the R6A here is a matter of four units, and essentially with regards to the height, you'll see in front of you it's a matter of zero differential in height. We further note that there have been many concerns with regards to the community garden, which is adjacent to the property. We understand this. We've done rezonings before, which are adjacent to community gardens. This is important to us because when we fought so hard at the, community, at the city planning commission for an R7A, we demonstrated through evidence what an R7A building would look like, and more importantly, what that building would, would do with regards to the community garden, with regards to shadows. So we submitted an M11 study with regards to the existing building as far as shadows and with regards to the now reduced R6A. So what you see in front of you is a shadow study. This is what happens in four different measurement points during the year. This is basically a standard uh, measurement procedure with regards to the environmental assessment statements that are filed with the Department of City Planning. So this is what happens in December. You'll notice to the northwest of the parcel, the community garden is in shadow. This is during the December season where the, this is not a planting season. And so you'll notice as far as the M11 parcel is concerned and the projected shadows, the situation of this parcel on basically an east-west thoroughfare as well as the position of the sun result in, in the month of June, most of the uh, community garden being uh, ba basically available for sun with sunlight for planting as well as in the March um, iteration as well as in the May iteration. So again, um, the December uh, the December iteration has it entirely cast in shadow with the three remaining planting seasons to be fairly open. You'll now notice that with regards to the R6A, again in December, the community garden is cast into shadow. However, because of the positioning of the, of the parcel and because of the travel of the sun, you'll see that this is the shadow study for March where you have in the, by 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, noting the different shades, the uh, community garden is is, uh, has a much wider planting area. And then as you go into May and the June seasons as well, you'll notice that as time passes over the course of the day, the community garden is, is, uh, is uh, that there's additional sunlight available to the community garden. So we did studies with regards to R7A, which city planning found compared favorably. With the R6A, this is even more so. I'd finally note that uh, with regards to the pictures provided of the surrounding area, you'll note that the community garden in these pictures, these were taken from publicly available sources, that there is a, a lot of tree cover on the community garden. So without making any judgments, I know there's a lot of people who are interested in talking about this. Uh, we find that the R6B and the R6A are va basically very similar in terms of the building type you will get here, and that uh, we're, we're hopeful that we can move through with this rezoning because the R6A would allow a, a more productive use of the property, which is more contiguous and contextual with the surrounding residential uses, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Just, just two quick, quick Please. questions, if you don't mind. Um, so I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear that you did a study um, that deals with the shadow impacts, because uh, I know that the council member and, and myself have gotten a lot of inquiries about that. Um, but just Really quickly, um, I, considering that, that under both uh, an R7A and an R6A, uh, the proposed building would not trigger the the 1,200, uh, the 12,500 uh, square feet um, for affordable housing through MIH. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit of what the public benefit uh, would be provided as a result of the project? M Mr. Chair, can I just, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. So let, let me just be clear. In the building you're proposing, is there any affordable housing? There's not. Uh, given, given not that one there's, unit? Given that there's five units, Are you contributing not. one dollar? Uh, at this point, while we're happy to talk about that, we're, there's no current open proposal. At this point, it's pretty late in the process. So you, there's not one unit, not one square foot, not one dollar of the project that you're proposing That's correct. for affordable housing. That's correct. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Chair. I was just leading to that question. Yeah, well, no, I thought, you know, we should be clear. <laughs> sure. So uh, there's, there's several aspects of the proposal which really uh, are, are a public benefit. The first is that this proposal does not just involve the subject property. It involves three parcels. To the extent that the central parcel, which is a 6,100 square foot lot, was included in this development site, 
that parcel would generate affordable housing. So they would not basically be able to wave out. They would generate more than the 12,500 square feet. So there would be affordable units that would be generated, which would be under the R6A up to seven units that would be in the center parcel. The second is essentially a point that was made earlier, which is whether or not you're looking at affordable housing as well as uh, market rate housing and housing in general. Pursuant to the 2018 study that was put out by the New York City Comptroller, uh, there's a discussion of the fact that housing in general is in, is, in, uh, is in short supply, and the fact is that this would create additional units right now where there are none created. Uh, finally, this is an M11 zoning district. Uh, the zoning of this parcel would allow up to a 2.4 FAR. The proposed rezoning to R6A would allow a 3 without affordability and a 3.6 with affordability. So the actual margin between whether or not the building would be, um, would be feasible under the M11 versus the R6A is important to note. Why? Because the M11 building would produce a, a building of similar size to the current proposal. However, that building would, would be populated by commercial, if not manufacturing uses. So we feel that those areas of public benefit are important again looking at the housing in general as well as the fact that the rezoning does not contemplate solely this parcel but also contemplates uh, affordable housing on the cent on the largest portion of the property Great. i'm going to turn it over now to uh, council member landis thank you mr chair all right so i just want to make sure i'm clear because most of what you said in response to the chair's question was about things that would be true if this was rezoned to r6b as well so the, and I don't think the community would have a problem if you were proposing to rezone it to R6B. So I guess what I am asking is, what's the incremental public benefit of the difference between 6B and 6A? Uh, and it sounds like the only thing you're saying is the additional market rate housing that would be developed, which on your site is how much? There's, there's five units that would be developed on our site. That could be developed, you just told us, under 6B, too. So what is the incremental benefit of the 6A or, zoning? Hmm? So the central parcel here at an R6B zoning district would be a 2.2 FAR, while the central parcel, par, parcel under an R6A would be a 3.6 FAR. So this is a material benefit. I, I under, that's sure. not a public benefit. So the, you're saying that the, the reason we should approve a 6A zoning when the rest of the block is 6B and what the community wants uh, is 6B is for a few additional market rate housing units. It's also the ability to actually develop, which is that under an R6B zoning district, on this site in particular, given the situation of the site on an extra wide seat, I, on an extra wide, if I can just. I don't believe it's, you, it's I'm a, sorry. No, R6B, no, fine, if we rezone this site to R, if we were able to rezone this site to right. R6B, it would get built at R6B. I'm not sure whether the, how the land price would be transacted. There's lots of R6B construction on lots of right. this the, size. The only issue is that that's the, the reason that city planning rezoned it to an R6A was because the R6B bulk is less than what's currently permitted at the site. And so uh, the, the idea basically would be that the to, to marginal- To be clear, it's less than what would be permitted on the site under a community facility building. Commercial and community facility. What would currently be permitted on the site under residential is none. So 6B would be substantially more residential square footage than is currently than permitted zero, on the sure. site. Of course. A lot more. Uh, okay, so I don't yeah. buy your argument that if we rezoned it to 6B, which may or may not be in scope of this application, there would be a problem getting it built out. I don't know, so I mean, and you know, it would be pretty different, the whole application, if you were bringing us all three parcels, right? So if your, applic if your client had assembled these three parcels and was bringing us an application that then included affordable units, it would be easier to understand sure. why the additional density that you're proposing has public benefit. But I just, so far, what you're saying is the reason that I should support 6A rather than 6B is a little bit of additional market rate housing. The, the added incentive to produce additional units and the ability to actually do residential here instead of maintaining what could be a noxious commercial use. Um, okay, so you're showing a five-story building now. Is that the, that's the tallest building that would be permitted on the site? The tallest building would be 55 feet, but given the floor to ceiling heights, uh, we showed what we would build, which is uh, five stories at 10 foot floor to ceiling heights. And what if it were combined with the two adjacent parcels? Then if it combined with the two adjacent parcels, you'd, you'd end up producing uh, a building with R6A bulk, which would have a full complement of mandatory inclusionary housing because you wouldn't wave out for, any, for the two smaller parcels. And uh, the maximum height that would be available for that building would be uh, 80 feet with uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, which 
you know, would, would result in additional units and would result in additional affordable units. So it's a little hard to know what we're getting because if we vote in favor of this, we might get a five-story building with no affordable housing or maybe someone else would come along and assemble the three parcels and build an 80-foot building. They could only do that if they did include at least 25 percent affordable housing. But we could get an 80-foot building on this site pursuant to this zoning, yes? Uh, it's, it's possible. Um, possible. I think that the, the argument that was made at city planning was that the corner lot and the lot on Hamilton is even more appropriate for R6A development. So first of all, the portion that was adjacent to the R6B, which is our lot, would still be limited in height. You still have a transition rule. To what? To 55 feet. So you would basically, for properties that are adjacent to R6B districts, there is typically a step down in the building so that if you had a larger portion, it would be in the area that was, uh, that was not adjacent to the R6B district. And, and, and council member, to the extent you want us to pencil out the, uh, the as, a, as a single zoning lot, we'd be happy to do that. I, I mean, it's hard to know what to do with the penciling out because once we would vote for this, we would not have any power over what happens subsequently. Sure, uh, we, we'd be happy to at least show you what that development scenario looked like. Might look like. Might, sure. Okay. Um, on your shadow studies, you've showed four, but two of them were May and June. Correct. Are those different seasons? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, the idea is that it's it's raised in the uh, in in each season. So it's uh, they basically pick the uh, solstice. What months did we omit to put May and June in the proposal? Oh, I can take a look. It's it's uh, it's pursuant to the EAS, which was uh, which was given a negative declaration by city planning. So this was a, you know, this was an adopted document. Convenient to pick May and June as two of the four months you show in a, that's not how I learned the quarters Understood. of the year. Council member, again, we're happy to provide additional shadow studies. We, we provided them for city planning in the course of the application. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna ask any more questions because there's a lot of people here I wanna listen to. I, I, I feel genuinely torn about this application. I really do. The easy thing for me to do would be to be mindful of the fact that it's unanimously opposed by its neighbors and just have told you from the beginning I'm not gonna support it. But I believe we need additional density in the city. I believe we need more housing and it's hard to do everywhere. And so I wanted to make a real possibility to listen and to hear the proposal, but I just have to be honest. The the compelling case of public benefits for the additional density that you're asking the community to support are pretty thin. Uh, we appreciate your opinion in that regard. Uh, this was done, this was, you know, when we, when we start out an application, what we discuss with the city is a land use rationale. And so when they look at this area and they look at rezonings generally, they look at avenues and they look at side streets. And so in that regard, an R7A was considered to be appropriate. We provided, you know, evidence to city planning. It was down zone to an R6A, we understand that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, it's, it's a, it is a, it's with a view towards uh, what land use should should be and whether or not it's appropriate on a wide street facing a fan plant that, so, that it's appropriate to have a slightly higher district than a side street. Okay. I mean, I, I guess I'll ask it just one last time sure. because if you were bringing an R6B application here, then all your rationale about eliminating noxious uses would be gone. You could build more or less the same thing on the site that you're currently proposing as the application that you currently have. So you would have the vast majority of the benefits that you're bringing and the support of the community. So like one more time, tell me what you would say to the people behind you sure. about why we should support something that they all really dislike for its additional shadow impacts and its additional height impacts on the neighborhood with the only really contemplated additional benefits maybe being a few more units of market rate housing. Like what argument would you make that that's the responsible policy decision? I, to I think at some point that you look at the feasibility of a development site. This is a 2,500 square foot lot. While the R6A and R6B would be available at the same heights, the truth is that the bulk of those buildings would be 5,000 square feet for an R6B and 7,500 square feet for an R6A. You would be able to flesh out the building design further on an R6A. So it's whether or not you want- Can you tell me you're more or less building the proposal you showed us you could more or less do under R6B? Correct, but no, no, no. And I, it's what feasible. I said, council member, what I said was that the height of 50 feet is available in the R6B. The height of this R6A parcel adjacent to an R6B is 55 feet. So while the height remains the same under both or similar, the bulk of this allow it allows it to be uh, to have a more feasible floor plate and makes really for a feasible development. Uh, the risk here would be feasible to build an R6 building on the site of that 
you we're talking about an r6 b building it would be, be feasible would to be build. less feasible to build it it's, wouldn't it would it, or would not do you think would, be feasible to it would build? be less feasible to well, build less r6. money would be made because you'd be building a smaller building that's for sure are sure. you saying it would not be feasible to build an r6 building on this site an r6 b building you're saying it would not be feasible i'm saying it would be less feasible it would be less likely to be built okay okay thank you mr chair thank you uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Chair, Council Members. Yeah. Uh, I will be calling up the next panel, and uh, I just want to let you know that uh, you have a two-minute time limit. We have a lot of folks here to testify, so please try to keep it to two minutes. Um, Eric uh, Tommen. Uh, David Lutz. Ariel uh, Muir. And uh, Dennis uh, Connors. If you can just uh, state your name and we can begin w with you. Hello, my name is Eric Toman, resident of Carroll um, Carol Street and founder of Backyard Garden. David Lutz, I'm, I'm uh, acting uh, coordinator of the Backyard Community Garden, live on Van Brunt Street. Okay, all right, okay, um, thank you. Members of the uh, City Council, uh, including my council, uh, men Brad Lander, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today against the rezoning proposal before you on 41 Summit Street. Before beginning, I would like to say on the advice of Parks Council that I am a Parks employee. However, what I am saying is, uh, my, own personal, uh, is my own personal opinion and I'm here on my own personal time. Um, nothing that I say here reflects the opinions or the policy of the Parks Department. So I do work uh, for the Parks uh, Green Thumb as an outreach coordinator. It's a vital position in the uh, city, um, um, where city policy comes into direct contact with its uh, 20,000 citizens. And just last night, I was in a community board meeting speaking about the vital import, uh, importance of community gardens and I need your help to help protect our um, backyard garden here. Um, uh, but I'm here to, uh, today not as a city uh, employee, but I'm here as a resident, 25 year resident of Carroll Street and the original founder of the backyard garden. Um, both cases, they, are, they will be affected by the shadow that would be cast by the 41 Summit Street proposal. Um, Carroll, uh, Carroll Street is a human scale neighborhood. Um, the City Council affirmed this in your uh, 2009 resolution for the 86 block rezoning of Carroll Gardens and the Columbia Street area. Um, Carroll Street is also uh, has a, a special interest in that it's one of the only double LA's in New York City. And that is a great display of two rows of calorie pear trees on both sides of the sidewalk. That cannot be two minutes. Uh, it's two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good morning. I want to thank you. You just got to speak into the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to present a little bit of information that refers to the backyard community garden. Uh, first, I saw some slide presentations today that were new to me, and it showed some shadow studies. And I would like to let the council know that when that garden was designed, it was designed to include a shady side and a sunny side. And the slide presentations I saw today cast shade on the sunny side of the garden which is the area which people use to grow vegetables, which require full sun. So we would lose that full sun. 
I'd also like, I, I, I believe that this committee is going to be meeting with uh, friends of the Brooklyn Ban Botanic Garden within the next few days, and they're gonna come with a similar complaint. You can't grow a garden uh, in shade. Uh, what we depend on at the backyard is a kind of a trade-off. We ask, we give people a little bit of land to grow some vegetables to teach their children where vegetables come from. And we ask of them in return service to the community, service to the garden, including keeping the garden open during uh, op open hours and, and uh, being a presence, a welcoming presence in the community. And I think that's part of the reason you go, you're gonna hear from a lot of people today, the support we have. Uh, I would hate to see that change. I think that if the garden goes into shade, uh, it would be much more difficult to retain the active, involved community membership that we have. Uh, so I would appreciate if the council chooses to vote no on this proposal. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Ariel Meyer. I'm a resident of 22 Carroll Street, local mother, two young children, one college age. Um, I'd like to submit 27 emails of testimony of people who couldn't be here today in objection to this proposal. Um, and um, I'd also like to mention all of us who are here and who have been working so hard to bring our view to you are on our own time, taking time off from work, time away from our families, and I think that that's important because it, show, it tells you about our community, um, which we are um, a mixed-use neighborhood in a transportation desert. Bus doesn't run so well. Um, our schools are overcrowded. There's no local hospital. We don't have the infrastructure in place. Um, we need smart, well thought out rezoning and new development. I feel that this project does not support our neighborhood. Our neighborhood doesn't support this project. Um, for one thing, there's no affordable housing, no sustainability or energy efficiency, no parking provided, um, to increase congestion and smog, far from good transportation options, so more car ownership is likely. Um, Bad precedent for Brooklyn being, re, you know, all the other M1 lots that you'll see in slides that, you know, what's going to happen to our neighborhood. Um, community garden, the rear yards, I'm a Carroll Street resident, our rear yards will be blocked, will be in shade. Um, I'm raising children, you know, teaching them about being outdoors. It's important. Um, so... I hope you'll support our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Denise Connors. I live at 149 Van Brunt Street. I'm a founding member of the Backyard Community Garden and a resident of the Columbia Waterfront District. I've lived there for about 20 years. I'm opposed to the rezoning of 41 Summit Street and the two adjacent properties attached to this proposal because there is no guarantee that affordable housing must be included. R6B is in continuity, not the proposed upzoning. Putting our garden in so much shade imperils the health of our beloved garden, which is also an important community resource. Please do not vote your approval for this upzoning. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for your testimony today. Um, I will now call up the next panel. Matthew uh, Nayswander, am I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Matthew? No. Uh, Owen Foote, Gail Ressler, and Abigail Hill. Just make sure your mic is on and um, announce your name and you may begin. Hi, my name is Matt Nyswander. I live with my family at 12 Carroll Street, 
And uh, as someone new to this process, it's surprising and kind of frustrating to me that a relatively recent zoning could be overturned without any real justification. Doesn't seem like any case has been made that circumstances have changed in the neighborhood and there's, there's no real benefits being offered except this remote possibility of affordable housing, but it seems dependent on a bewildering array of contingencies. So I hope that you, you will listen to the, the voices of our neighborhood and the community board and the, the borough president and see that this is an out of scale development and would diminish the distinct character of our neighborhood, our low rise neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you. you may begin. Good morning, my name is Owen Foote. I am a city employee, but I'm here today um, on personal time to express my concerns as an architect and urban planner for the past 25 years. I submitted testimony that I won't be able to read today because I think it would go over the two minutes, but I wanted to point out one of the um, uh, uh, comments that our councilman has made. He said, let's be honest. So one thing that we have before us is three lots. The honesty is that the bank, which is the middle and the only lot that could potentially generate affordable housing, will not be developed. We know this because all of the other bank lots that are single lots in our community have not been developed. So let's be honest. We're talking about two private lots, one to generate 7,500 square feet of private uh, ownership and uh, no affordable housing, another with 5,500. That's 13,000 square feet of non-affordable housing at our neighborhood in today's market is earning about $13 million. $13 million for the proposal before you today, no affordable housing. It's unlikely that bank's gonna be developed when any other bank in our neighborhood is not. That sets a new policy standard for areas all over our city. I'm uh, sad that the other council members are not in the room because it's really, um, this council's next two and a half years is going to mandate that when we upzone communities of the city of New York, we mandate the need for affordable housing. We need responsible development and a guaranteed community benefit on this and future proposals that come before you. I'm gonna repeat something that was said earlier today because I found it to be very passionate and um, I, uh, I love that the council person said this. Unfortunately, she's not in the room and perhaps somebody could uh, share this testimony with her. Your next two and a half years of our government is to preserve creativity, authenticity, and to support the character of our mixed income neighborhood soul. I hope you take that responsibility seriously and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gail Ressler. And um, just to continue the thought, I thought that the words from Majority Leader Cumbo were very um, inspiring and encouraging. And I thought that the questioning from Mr. Lander was really pointed and I think asked the questions on behalf of the community and I appreciate that. Um, I've spent my adult life in three Brooklyn neighborhoods, Brooklyn Heights, Cabo Hill, and in, for the last eight years in the Columbia Street Waterfront District. I chose to invest in my home in this neighborhood for its charm, its small town feel, and its blend of creative and working class people. As a freelancer who often works from home, my quality of life is integrally tied to my home. While this neighborhood lacks the elegant brownstones of my previous neighborhoods, it makes up for it with light and openness and a relaxed neighborly vibe that's priceless. The community garden next to my bank at Hamilton and Summit offers a respite when running the most basic of errands and the neighbors who created it display the willingness to work hard to create the type of neighborhood which we can enjoy living in together. It's a neighborhood that embraces affordable housing in our backyard, in our front yard, but just not over our heads. Just eight years ago, the relative affordability of the Columbia Street Waterfront District was also a great attraction for me and for most of my neighbors and myself, getting priced out of our beloved neighborhood is a real concern. We're aware and share in the concern for affordable housing in our city because we are among the people who need moderately priced housing to stay in Brooklyn. Unfortunately, what we see in the proposed plans for rezoning on Summit Street is not a likelihood of affordable housing at all. Um, and none is legally required. This proposal allows building taller than the surrounding area for no public benefit, 
building to the maximum bulk and height would be out of scale with our neighborhood and will simply add to our already overcrowded schools and streets. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Abby Hill and I live in an apartment on Lower Carroll Street in the area that will be very much affected by the new building project. I have heard what is happening and how technically the city owns the air rights and the ability for these buildings to be, to be so much bigger than the neighboring buildings and that the negotiations you are making with the owners of these properties therefore must somehow benefit the area and the people where they are being built. Where I am living is a building that is very insecure in, in its future and if this type of building is allowed to go through I think it would set a legal precedent in the area and our building would be next. Also, it would be without any benefit to the area or to us. I am a low income single mom and I have been applying for um, public housing on Housing Connect, on the Housing Connect website for over seven years. One single time I was called and chosen to apply to the Gowanus building on Bond Street because I was in the neighbor, I was a resident of that neighborhood and I qualified perfectly, but because of an employment, my employment changed during the process of the uh, two-year application, I became, and I became a self-employed scenic artist because I'm an artist. Um, I was turned down because of a rule that said that if you were a freelancer, you had to have three years prior to the application in order to be approved. I was devastated. Um, what I'm saying is that it is so rare to be picked for housing and there needs to be more support for the local artists and allowances for artists to, in the affordable housing um, rules and in general. And if these buildings are approved and as, as planned, um, if these buildings are approved as planned, I demand as a resident of this neighborhood that they must include low middle income housing and apartments, and that the neighborhoods and residents of the area are given preference. Please don't let this happen. Th thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask a kind of a general question of you guys, and I'd welcome future folks to offer reflections on it as well, and I'll do it briefly, because we have a lot of people who are here, and also because it's like a little politically foolish of me to like push back on my constituents, but I want to engage us in a serious and honest conversation. I'm gonna take Owen's invitation to do so, because Look, you're right, the applicant has not presented any meaningful public benefit for the difference between 6A and 6B. So it is hard for me to, uh, to anyway, to, to, to take seriously that proposal. But on the other hand, part of the reason why I do is that we have a massive affordable housing crisis. We've added 500,000 people to the city and units for less than a third of them. So we are collectively increasing the crisis. And pretty much every time we get an application, um, it is opposed on density grounds. So I'm sorry that the rules are the, the way they are, and I'd love to work with you to change them, but the building you mentioned on Bond Street is one of the few places in our community where there are some affordable units that somebody has been able to move into. That was also opposed by almost all of its neighbors who were sure that it was too much density for that site. That's just where we are. and like. Like you guys, like I live in a three-story row house not too far away. I love the scale, I love the gardens, I love the neighborhood, but I feel a, a responsibility for how we're dealing with the housing crisis, and I don't feel like collectively we are taking it on together. I'll just be honest. We all are sure it should be solved somewhere, but every time it's right by us, we don't want it, and I don't, that's not just you. You're not more like that than me. You're not more like that than our, most of our neighbors. I don't even think it's just like I'm white. You know, the, this panel is white. I don't, you know, that's how we kind of all are in this city. But it just begs a bigger question that I would just like to ask you to be thoughtful of. And I, this is not because I'm persuaded of the argument on the other side. The argument for the other side was made pretty poorly today in terms of public benefit. But being snide about being honest while we're hoarding our lovely neighborhoods without taking a broader sense of shared responsibility for how we are gonna accommodate growth in a diverse and inclusive city, I don't feel like it sits well on us either. So I guess I would like to understand, I hear you on this application and I don't think you're wrong about it. I'd like to hear a little better sense of like, where, how should we be solving this problem? What should we be willing to sacrifice for it? Um, and not on somebody else's back, but in a way that we have some skin in the game too. 
So it's a pretty general question. I don't have it. There's not an easy answer to it, but it is weighing on me in this hearing, and I'd be lying if I pretended it wasn't. So the more we can own that responsibility together, the better chance I have. I think that we will have both on this site and as we move forward. So if you want to offer reflections, fine. Otherwise, as future folks testify, I will look to them. So uh, just a very quick, um, when the city council uh, approved the mandatory inclusionary housing proposal, they limited it to sites that have development potential of greater than 12,500 square feet. In certain communities, like our neighborhood, which I moved into close to 30 years ago, the real estate price was at that time $100 a square foot to purchase property. Now it's $1,500 a square foot to purchase property. So you and have because opportunities. Because we downzoned the entire neighborhood Understood. in 2009, and what I'm, what I'm saying is new development, either market rate or affordable. There's certain areas of our city, including um, our neighborhood, where when a property owner comes in and wants to build, they have such a profit margin that they should guarantee affordable housing uh, regardless of how big they build. If they build a 5,000 square foot building, they should guarantee support of affordable housing. That's what I've heard from our elected officials. I've uh, only met with uh, two elected officials, but the idea of uh, restricting it to development sites of over 12,500 square feet in our area that has a very high market value, I think, is unfortunate, and I understand it had to be citywide, and you now have the opportunity every time an applicant comes before you in our neighborhoods to demand that of them mm -hmm. within their development property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony today. And uh, I do agree with my uh, council colleague on uh, what he said today. It's something that we as a um, body and as uh, members of this committee struggle with every day. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, uh, you brought that up and, and said it today. So thank you for that, uh, council member. Uh, the next panel uh, that is coming up is Jill Bernstein. Uh, we have uh, Katarina uh, Jarenik. Say that right? Jarenik. Jarenik. Sorry about that. That's OK. Um, and Eric Carell, and someone with just one name, John. John? So we can begin. You just state your name and. My name is Jill Bernstein. I'm a resident of 25 Carroll and the mother of two children at PS58, our local zone school. Our elected officials were some of the most vocal opponents of Amazon recently bringing its HQ2 to Long, I Long Island City. The argument was that this proposal was going to do nothing for the community and accept a lot of benefits, but it had no community benefit. We are here today because we, their actual constituents, find ourselves in the same position. The scale admittedly is different. This is a small building. It sets a huge precedent. Where we live is a frontier in many respects for development. We know development is coming. We are not against it. There will be buildings. There will be housing. We are not fighting that. This is a symbolic moment for us, which is why we all are all here. The R6B would be a much preferable way to do this, and we should start thinking about it now. We live here in this community. We are raising our kids here. We are looking out for each other's kids here. It is a unique place, an economically mixed environment and uh, we are in it. We are happily embracing, eagerly embracing District 15's new middle school initiative to diversify these middle schools even though there's an extreme amount of uncertainty given these brand new rules for our 11 year olds going in next year. We believe in this and it will improve the fabric of our neighborhood despite the fact that so many of our peers are leaving the city and going to private schools. It is a real big moment, and we are in this, and we are working hard to make this diversification work. We want to know that people, our elected officials, are looking for, out as, out for us as well as we are extending our lives in this exact specific little community. Um, we want responsible growth. As this happens, inevitably, we are not fighting it. This is going to happen. We need traffic abatement. Councilman, Landers know, Councilman Lander knows how emphatic we are about the traffic in this neighborhood. It is Mad Max Thunder Road down here. We need help. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Katarina Jarnik, and I've had the good fortune to live in the neighborhood for about 10 years, and I've been on Carroll Street, mid-block, just north of the proposed building on 41 Summit. I'm an artist, and in order to afford the cost of living in the city, I also have an arts administration job, which I took time off from this morning to come here and ask you not to support this proposal. I'm also a renter. Um, and I'm fortunate to have reasonably priced rent that I can now afford. Many re of my neighbors are also renters, and some own their buildings and, they, and live there and rent to my neighbors. My neighbors are other artists, musicians, writers, teachers, small business owners, contractors, gardeners, career civil servants, retired people. They're mainly middle class and working class and creative class people, and we live in a mixed income neighborhood, we need affordable places to live. Um, could our neighborhood use more diversity? Of course it could, but 41 Summit Street will likely have the opposite effect. Um, it's not required to have any affordable units, and the developer has n expressed no wish to offer them voluntarily. Instead, it will only bring market rate apartments that neither I nor most of my neighbors could ever afford, wrapped in the vague possibility of a few affordable units at adjacent lots if only two different property owners decide to develop their lots together. What will happen to my currently affordable rent and the rent of my neighbors when these new market rate apartments with no affordable units come on the market? What will happen is what's been happening all over the city for decades. Everyone's rent will start to go up and we won't be able to afford to live here anymore. That's affordable housing lost with none gained. If this rezoning passes, it will send a signal to other developers that they can cash in here without providing any public benefits. Um, Instead, it could send a signal that any upzoning and subsequent development must include guaranteed affordable housing in the rezoning proposal and must respect the existing community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Eric Coriel. So I live in one of the buildings that was circled in red over there to which the uh, developer's representative said it was vacant. It's not vacant. I've been living there for the past five years. Uh, Con Edison and National Grid and Time Warner have no problem finding me there. So um, I would cast uh, that as a simple elementary fact that is incorrectly reported, so cast doubt on the veracity of their entire presentation as far as I'm concerned. But I would um, like to talk about, uh, Councilman Lander, your idea of how do we solve this maybe going forward. And I did have a litany of other complaints, but I'm going to just, they've been so well expressed by other, of, uh, by so many of my neighbors. Um, I think, well, one, two things. One is there needs to be a calculus. I'm totally in support of your, your uh, being pro-affordable housing. I am as well, but I have affordable housing where I am now. I'm an artist, as my neighbor was just saying, so many of us are. It's so much in the spirit of the neighborhood. It is so hard to find affordable housing as an artist. My studio is in my apartment. I'm very productive, I think, member of the cultural community here in the city, and particularly in that part of Brooklyn. Um, there needs to be a calculus about what is lost and what is gained. What is lost would be my affordable housing, which I'm clearly not in favor of. So the, the, I think that in the two ways, two ideas to think about how to solve this is what is in it, you know, how can we make people who are living where they're living and are getting kicked out, give them an incentive to be for affordable housing, for example, if it was the case that I had to move, I would be offered an incentive of some monetary reward to find new, new housing for myself. And then B, I think the proposal from um, Majority Leader Cumbo about making things beautiful, making proposals um, something that we want to have in the neighborhood, making designs inspiring. These are things that I think would get people on board um, more quickly than the logistics of zoning regulations and housing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Tram. Um, part of why I'm here is, is to talk about why you, you as a committee need to be responsible. If we were not here to fight for this and it was a different part of the community and they presented, no one potentially would fight back. And part of it is the responsibility of the committee to say it is responsible or irresponsible. Part of their design is very, um, doesn't have any LEED certification or sustainability components to it. Um, I know there's initiatives to try to force that or enforce that on buildings, but their design does not in incorporate any of that in it. Um, part of it is also 
in an allowing spot rezoning, it leaves opportunity for other people or other projects to come in and do the same. So I ask that you guys be responsible on trying to figure out if it makes enough sense or not. Currently, you've already spoken about what you thought and that they didn't make a clear enough argument for it. But for all the projects and people that who don't fight against it, are you enforcing anything to help that process? And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I will be calling up the next panel, uh, Anthony uh, Bradfield, Ann Schwartz, sorry, uh, Stuart uh, Broski, Carol Marlino, On. Um, my name is Anthony Bradfield. I live at 22 Carroll Street. Um, I, uh, I've lived there for 13 years. I'm an elementary school teacher. I took a personal day to be here today. Um, I had some, uh, some uh, um, uh, com um, testimony prepared. It was for three minutes. I wanted to um, just, I'll just speak then, which is to say that um, this has been an a, uh, uh, a learning process for me. I've been, uh, um, but I've been encouraged by the ULERP process. I, I, I believe that, that what comes out of it is um, a honest uh, appraisal of, of the merits of this proposal. And what the community board has said and what the uh, uh, Brooklyn uh, Borough President has said that, that, um, that it is with very little merit. And, but that, those both points have been made, and I think, uh, uh, Council Member Lander, your, your, your questioning was, I mean, there's, you have a, there's no um, uh, need to convince you of what, how this is being proposed. Um, what I would like to say, though, is that I would like to take you up on your, on your challenge, that we would like to, to make a um, affordable housing or housing as an issue for that, that we can participate in and also uh, put our skin in the game. And, and, I'm, and I appreciate that the fact that this uh, proposal has come up early on in, in, the, uh, in the ULERP uh, deadline that, that there is still time to, to talk with you and to talk with the, uh, um, the city, the, the council. Um, that I think the deadline for voting is uh, uh, still some time away. Um, we, would, we would like the, 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 um, the chance to do that. Um, uh, I mean, for me, I, I just don't see how that uh, the proposal could be considered, um, and that your your point that if they come back with a, a larger assemblage um, would make it a much different scenario. So I pass this on to you. Anu. Thank you. Hi, my name's Anu Schwartz. Uh, thanks for hearing my testimony. I'm a resident of Columbia Waterfront. I also have a presentation, which I won't go through all the slides for time reasons, but I want to address um, your, your questions, Councilman Lander, about um, getting into the, the details of how uh, we as a community would accept development and responsibly, because it's a good question to pose back to the community. And I think the view that I would like to show here is, is of the neighborhood, as you see, is largely a low-rise neighborhood and how to get affordable housing seems like bulk would be the way to do that. But I think the neighborhood, as you can see, particularly this lot, is not on a corner. You can see it's almost mid-block with the rest of the neighborhood looking north. So I would propose if we're gonna talk about affordable housing and getting development into the neighborhood, it should be done responsibly and choosing lots that make sense for bulk and not in areas where it affects low-rise build adjacent buildings. Um, I had a lot to say today about the community, but I feel like I wanted to get into the question you're asking because it seems it's getting down to that granular level of how do we responsibly develop our neighborhood 
and get affordable housing in the neighborhood through development, and I think it has to be thought out responsible development. I think this proposal does not account for any of that uh, and should be rejected on that premise alone. And uh, consider the, uh, the current zoning of R6B. Um, and for future, um, take a broader look at the neighborhood. Um, and thank you for the time. Thank Appreciate you. It. Hi, my name is Stuart Borowski, and I live on Carroll Street, 47 Carroll, with I have a third grader and a fifth grader at PS58, and uh, my neighbors are, are really well-spoken, and uh, just one thing that I heard in previous testimony that I wanted to repeat, perhaps, is that there are quite a few uh, lots in the neighborhood that have yet to be developed. I moved in eight years ago, and in that time, there were several uh, buildings that were finished and, uh, and some of the people in this room have moved in and they were all essentially at the same height and there are still plenty of potential for future housing including perhaps uh, affordable housing even if the buildings proposed at 41 Summit and the adjacent lots are actually at a similar height to the, to the surrounding neighborhood. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening to all the testimony and, and uh, yeah, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Hi, my name's Claire Merlino. I've lived in the Columbia Waterfront neighborhood for 40 years. I've been active in numerous successful community-based environmental initiatives over many of those years. The current R6A zoning proposal means a reduction in height and bulk compared to the original proposal for R7A, but still has zero community benefits. Most problematic for me is the lack of any consideration for affordable housing in any form. There's been much discussion in our neighborhood over the years, not just solicited by this proposal, but about ongoing gentrification and the concurrent loss of diversity. Thoughtful affordable housing clearly supports diversity of income, background, and in education. And in addition, we have an affordable crisis, housing crisis in the neighborhood, and our neighborhood is no, exist, no exception. My neighbors and I welcome the opportunity for more affordable housing in the neighborhood. Since the current proposal in front of you confers zero community benefits, many of which has been addressed by other speakers, what is the point of approving this one building? On the face, it appears to be a handout to the developer, and to what end? The other two property owners we have seen are clearly not involved in any development discussion. It appears that this is a ploy to get around the much decried spot zoning problem that has besotted so many New York City neighborhoods. This purely speculative rezoning request on behalf of one developer who has no incentive to build any affordable housing. But there are opportunities for affordable housing in our neighborhood. There are a number of undeveloped or underdeveloped properties zoned as M11 that if zoned to R6B could yield affordable units and profit for the owners, while at the same time keeping to the spirit and context of our low-rise neighborhood that in 2009 was rezoned to mostly 6B. I have two examples, I'm running out of time, but one of them is there are four single owner contiguous lots with no buildings on them that currently are used for storing vehicles. For simplicity's sake, these lots total approximately 11,800 square feet, and even without calculating for any FAR, these lots are close to the 12,500 MIH seclusion. Once the appropriate FAR is applied, they could yield a reasonable number of affordable units, and this is just one example, and there are also some HBD units that could also yield affordable housing Thank you very much, and I ask you to reject the proposal in front of you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, I will call up the next panel. Uh, Marlene Raymer, Andrew Bradfield, Sarah Nolan, and Anna Mann. Thank you. My name is Marlene Reimer. Um, I just just on one second, Marlene. I'm sorry. Marlene, we have Andrew, yeah. yep. Sarah, and Anna. She left? OK. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. My name is Marlene Reimer. I'm a resident of 299 Columbia Street, and I'm also a member of the community garden. We live in a small bedroom. Can you just uh, speak into the microphone? Apartment. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. With a cat and a young child, the garden is our backyard. 
I garden, bring my food, scrap to compost, chat with people, let my son play in the dirt. When I learned about the rezoning request for 41 Summit and 75 and 79 Hamilton, I was just reading Michelle Obama's memoir, Becoming, and was struck by how her message can be applied to what's going on here. The proposed development of these buildings, they will only be built for personal gain. It's akin to what she describes what's going on in the country right now. Everyone thinks about themselves and grabs what they can. I was very moved by what she wrote, how first in her life she was driven to do well, get ahead for herself. And then she learned through Barack Obama to apply it to others, to help others grow, to think about the community at large. And this is embodied in the backyard garden, the connective tissue of the neighborhood. It's where neighbors meet each other, make friends, find business opportunities, get help, advice, and make connections they would otherwise never make. Open and public space is what makes a city. Life, city life does not happen when people cannot connect on the street. And circling back to Michelle Obama, she created the vegetable garden in the White House. Building a seven, eight, nine, whatever story building will make sure that the garden is totally shaded. People will stop going. In this community, we're all here, will turn into a place where everyone will go their own separate ways and does their own thing. I'm speaking out against the rezoning request and I hope you agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Morning, my name is Andrew Bradfield. I'm a uh, part owner of 22 Carroll Street, uh, which abuts the uh, proposed rezoned area. I, my profession is property development, so I wanted to just uh, echo some of the thoughts that uh, Mr. Foote uh, said about developing the, the p development potential for the bank lot. Uh, I agree with him that the likelihood of uh, the bank being developed is very unlikely under its current ownership structure. It's currently owned by the bank, uh, so Chase is the owner and the tenant. Um, but I, I wanted to address the possibility in the future that it, Chase did decide to sell it uh, looking at it from the perspective of uh, uh, as a developer. The m easiest way to resolve, uh, to mac optimize value from, for this property would be to uh, in develop a building that had a ground floor retail use uh, using approximately one FAR uh, for commercial and the rest, and then put uh, the rest of the bulk, 12,400 square feet of uh, pure market rate and forego maybe a quarter digit of FAR. That would allow uh, the developer to avoid the uh, encumbrances of affordable housing and, and almost completely mag uh, op optimize the full zoning envelope. Uh, that's, uh, it, to me, that it makes it very, um, it's not just a lack of a guarantee of affordable housing, it's almost certainty that it would not be because the, the rational economic analysis says that it shouldn't be uh, should be avoided. Uh, I also wanted to address the, the, uh, your, your general question about uh, the affordable housing crisis in New York. And I, I think the, 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 really the solution has to involve one principle, which is that doing it in at, at little rezonings one at a time is a, is a, is a nightmare. It's looking for critical mass uh, locations where you can build 50, 60, 70, uh, 150 affordable units. That's, that's, the, that's the place to seek the rezonings and put the, put the attention. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Sarah Nolan. I'm also a resident um, on Carroll Street. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, you've heard from the community here, architects, developers, designers, community garden members, um, and really have given a very compelling uh, picture of why this neighborhood is so unique and why people like to live in Brooklyn. I mean, why they like to live in New York City. Um, and I appreciate, uh, Council Member Lander, your probing questions to the developers. Um, and you can see we do take the, the affordable housing and the development needs of the of housing needs of the community very seriously um, and would echo that we don't, we know that development's going to happen. Um, but one thing we haven't heard is how this particular proposal is going to solve the housing crisis in New York. Um, we haven't really heard what the benefit is and any compelling um, explanation of the difference between the R6B and the R7A um, and what the, the developer said it would be less feasible, which really is code word for less profitable for them. Um, so for that reason, um, and we believe, I believe that they've presented a, less, a, a smaller building and have agreed to this to sort of diffuse the kind of opposition that you're seeing here today. Um, I think personally that we can and we should 
demand more from the developers in these kinds of proposals in terms of uh, sustainability, engaging community, um, community businesses and workers, and sustainability. Um, at the planning meeting, um, planning commission hearing on this issue, we had a, a proposal like that, a, a property in Bushwick that was being developed. And it was a partnership with a nonprofit in, the, in Brooklyn, and it provided a whole, a whole array of real tangible community benefits. And there wasn't a single person in that room that opposed it. No one from the community came out to oppose that plan. Um, so I think you're seeing here that if we allow this to go forward as it is, there really is no incentive to developers going forward to provide any of those kind of benefits, because they know they'll be able to get what they want um, by proposing more housing. Um, so I think we owe um, each other more than that, and I would hope this council would agree. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your testimony today. And I will be calling the last panel um, for uh, for this hearing, uh, Susan uh, Weltman and uh, Moet Santrum. <laughs> Susan, we can start with you. Yeah. Okay, my name is Susan Weltman. I live on Carroll Street. I've lived there 12 years. I feel very honored to be here. Um, it's a very exciting process. And um, I also oppose the building. I uh, am the daughter of a city planner. I've grown up hearing conversations about affordable housing and uh, the problems of cities my whole life. And I think this the point that you don't solve this with one building is very true. This, the city is failing this terribly. But I think this building provides no, uh, nothing for the community. It is uh, inappropriate, it's out of scale, it will indeed, I think, hamper the community garden, and I hope you all vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohit Santram. I'm a um, resident of 36 Carroll Street. Uh, along with my 13-year-old golden retriever. Um, I'm a designer who works from home, and as many of my neighbors have eloquently commented, the value of green space within our city cannot be solely measured in dollars and cents, price per foot, or the promise of affordable housing in a community that certainly faces the continued onslaught of air and noise pollution and ever-rising costs. I'd just like to ra uh, quote um, a line from Jane Jacobs in her seminal book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Cities that have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify uh, on this item? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application uh, and it will be laid over. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Lander. Um, wanna... uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for staying, Councilmember Rivera, especially for being here for the whole time, and Councilmember Koslowitz as well. And um, yes, yeah, so, you know, we'll have more to say on this. Obviously, we'll have to come back for a vote. So I'll I'll offer some more remarks then. But I I think I've I've said the things I am grappling with here, and I appreciate this committee and the public's grappling with them together. Uh, it is the first time I've heard the Euler process praised for enabling some serious public conversation. Um, but I, I worry, honestly, about what it has, what we have, have here today, because I feel like on the one hand, we do have a proposal with insufficient public benefit to merit the request, and on the other hand, uh, uh, an instinct that mapped citywide prevents us from being the city that we need to be. Like, I really do think that. And I think it's on us all, and I love the garden, and I love our blocks, and I love the energy you put into coming today. Like, I love the neighborhood that I represent. Uh, but I really think we have more responsibility to see the ways in which those impulses writ large uh, prevent us from building the inclusive city that we want to have, because this is not a neighborhood for everyone, like that lovely Jane Jacobs quote, and the beautiful garden and the beautiful neighborhood we have is not nearly as inclusive as it needs to be, and a set of decisions we make together keep it that way. So uh, that does not mean this application merits support, um, but it's hard. So, and look, as many of you know, we're facing also in the middle of the work on the Gowanus rezoning, um, 
uh, where we will have a lot more conversations about what is appropriate in our neighborhood and what we do planning at neighborhood scale as opposed to small block scale. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for your indulgence, thank, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we will now be moving on to our next public hearing for today, which is on LU's uh, 360, 361, uh, the former Parkway Hospital site zoning for property in council, council member uh, Kozlowitz's district in Queens. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone an R12A district to an R7A district and an R7X district, as well as a related zoning text amendment to designate the project area as mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two and the workforce option. As set forth in the application, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 14-story market rate residential building and the in enlargement and change of use of the former Parkway Hospital to an eight-story mixed-use building containing 68 affordable dwelling units, 67 affordable independent residents for senior units, heirs, and community facility space. In total, the proposal would consist of 351 uh, dwelling units and approximately 3,300 uh, uh, square feet, uh, I'm sorry, 300,000 uh, uh, square feet of floor area, a 5.3 FAR, and approximately 180 uh, accessory uh, parking spaces. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and I wanted to turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Kozlowitz uh, to deliver some remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today we are hearing an application that would allow for a project that is very important to me and my constituents. We need affordable senior housing in my district. I hear from my constituents about the need for affordable senior housing constantly. Too often, seniors are choosing between rent, medicine, and groceries. HPD data shows that over 60% of households with seniors in my district are earning 50% of the area medium income in or below. Too many seniors are living on Social Security alone, and we owe it to our seniors to ensure they can retire with dignity. This project can de deliver 135 affordable housing units for seniors in my district. I want to make clear that the affordable housing in this project needs to reflect affordability for seniors in my district. Those in the retirement age and I will not settle for anything that does not serve my constituents' needs. We have had several discussions with the applicants to make sure this project can prove, provide real affordable housing opportunities for seniors. We all recognize that the workforce MIH options is unresponsive to the needs of seniors, and we will continue our discussions to ensure that we have truly affordable housing by the end of this process. I look forward to hearing the testimony from the applicants and from the public. And I just want to say, that I've been working on senior housing in my district for over 25 years, trying to get some senior um, housing. And unfortunately, we lost Parkway Hospital. And now I saw an opportunity to have senior housing in my district. It's not enough, but it's something, it's the start of something. So I'm very excited about this and I hope it meets the approval. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Kozlowitz. Uh, we have Eric Polonik, uh, Alvin Schein. Schein. Schein, yeah. Schein, and Timothy uh, Henze. Timothy Henze had to leave, and Brian Newman is also signed up. He's the project architect, so Brian is going to speak. There should be a speaking card for him there. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, if the council would please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you I will answer all questions truthfully? Please state your name for the record as you respond. Eric Palatnik, I do. 
Uh, good morning, and, and thank you, Councilman, for a very concise introduction to the project. You've basically stolen all of my thunder. Uh, you did a very good job summarizing the entire project, so I'm not going to go through the, the, the details that you just recited, uh, especially since uh, it remains you and just a few others in the room, and the Councilwoman, I know, is incredibly familiar with the, the project. Uh, I'd like to set forth the overriding concepts uh, to what we're requesting of you today, uh, which is for a rezoning from an R1 <coughs> to a uh, to an R7A and an R7X on a site that we feel and, and, and the councilwoman feels uh, obviously and uh, the borough president one of the cats is supported as well as the community planning board to convert a derelict old hospital which is well known to everybody in the area uh, that sits sort of in this nook even though I mentioned before we're in an R1 2A district uh, there really is higher density around us and you can see on the aerial the six-story apartment building right next door to right across the street from us. Uh, we propose to include that within the rezoning area, therefore providing the land use rationale to increase the zoning in the area by making the existing six-story building legal and uh, allowing for the enlargement of the hospital for the senior housing. Uh, as was suggested before, when all is said and done, we will be creating 135 units of senior housing on the former Parkway Hospital site. We'll be proposing a market rate building uh, that will rest in the uh, parkway in the parking lot of the former Parkway Hospital that will front against the service road. Uh, the application, as I mentioned before, is very well supported locally. I don't believe there was any opposition to it uh, at the community board whatsoever. Uh, and we look forward to constructing it. Uh, the architect is here with us today, as is uh, Alvin Schein, uh, who helped us out with the affordability numbers. Thank you. Is there anything? I don't think they have anything to say uh, in particular, unless anybody has any questions. Thank uh, you. Uh, I, I just, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, and I might have uh, just missed that part. But uh, what does your market analysis show as the median income for seniors uh, that are the age of 62 and above? Well, we've prepared the market analysis, which uh, I handed over to, of course, to somebody before they left. Here it is. Uh, the market data that we discovered shows that within CB6, households that are age 55 and over uh, with incomes over $75,000 make up 59% of the elderly population. Uh, households with income over $100,000 make up 43% of the senior population. And that uh, by the year 2020, I believe, there will be 16,636 senior households uh, age 55 and over within the area that have incomes over $50,000. Uh, and that information was provided to support uh, the rationale for the uh, affordability numbers that we've provided. Thank you. And just, uh, I, we are going to be submitting uh, the incomes of uh, New York City seniors uh, for the record uh, as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, also, the, the CPC report on this application says the rezoning is to facilitate the development of uh, market rate apartment buildings and to renovate the former uh, Parkway Hospital uh, as affordable housing for seniors. Uh, however, the MIH mapping action you requested uh, the workforce option, which allows rent set at 115% uh, of MI, uh, uh, AMI. Uh, you've also stated that you wanted to uh, market half of the units in the building to, people's, uh, to people 62 and older with incomes capped at 80% uh, AMI. Uh, to, to slightly uh, uh, to, to correct uh, what you just said, we, we, we plan to cap the, the par former Parkway Hospital building itself, which is the, the hospital that's standing right now, is proposed to be enlarged to be eight stories and to hold 135 units in it that will be fully affordable senior units to age 62 and over. That will be, right now it's proposed, the way the application is presented, is at a 95% average AMI within that building utilizing the workforce option. That is, the, that is what is proposed right now. Uh, there is a discussion going on. Uh, about that right now that's uh, going on at another level. Okay, but isn't the workforce option inconsistent with the objective of providing affordable housing to retirees? Uh, no, not in this case. The, the, the philosophy behind the application and, and where we came to the 95% AMI 
is that there's a, a, a tremendous shortage of senior housing, as you know, in the city. The reason why there's such a dearth of affordable senior housing is there's no, there are very limited programs that are available to entice a developer to build senior housing. The, the one that comes to mind that, that we've been working on and talking about is Sarah, which Sarah has a, a very specific demographic target that it's trying to achieve. Right. Of course, there are other demographic targets that have needs as well. And unfortunately, there are no programs to achieve that, those demographics. So we've tried to create our own here. The proposal we're doing, we, we've set forth, does not take any, at 95% AMI, does not take any city money, unlike SARA, no state or any city money to do it. And it was proposed, we've created it like this because there is no program in place, and it would create a, a, a fully affordable senior development that would not be paid for with taxpayer dollars. It was gonna be funded uh, by the developer. And that's how we came to the 95% AMI. Uh, there are talks right now to maybe change that, as I, as I alluded to a moment ago. Uh, okay. So that's, uh, that's the philosophy. Got it. It, but under the proposed rezoning, what would prevent you from developing the Parkway Hospital building as a 100% workforce option building that is rented not to seniors but to the general uh, public? As of this particular moment, there is not. We are attempting right now to come to an agreement in place that will lock in the Parkway Hospital to make sure that that cannot happen. It is not the intent of anybody that's sitting at the table on the developer side, nor has it been stated that it's the intent of the councilwoman or anybody in city government to create anything other than fully affordable senior housing on the Parkway Hospital site. We have been grappling with the mechanism by which to do it and a program or a way to, to do that because there is nothing on the books that allows that to happen. It, as I said, unless, it, unless the developer utilizes city and state money to do it, there is no way for a developer to voluntarily lock into that. The heirs program does exist and that's one option that's available, but that also comes with its own quirks with respect to how that's being implemented right now. So we are working in an imperfect system uh, that with everybody has the, the greatest and most laudable goals to achieve uh, the end result, which is fully affordable senior housing. Uh, and, and we understand why you're asking the questions. It's, it's, you're not the first one to ask the question. Right. And, okay, so uh, also you might have said this, but can you remind me uh, how much parking is required on the site? Yeah, there's, there's a, a 149 parking spaces that are required. We're proposing uh, to take a bonus through the heirs uh, provision as well as there's also a bonus in the height that we're achieving through heirs uh, that will, but the, the parking, uh, we're providing 180. There are 149 proposed. Uh, the, the reason why we're asking for the bonus through the heirs is because uh, we've been having uh, conversations with the school next door. Uh, they are very short, as the councilwoman will tell you, on parking on, on the at the school that's located immediately to the right of us. Uh, so we're trying to work with them to free up additional spaces uh, to accommodate them, not necessarily for free, uh, but uh, to provide parking for their teachers who uh, don't have anywhere to park. And as the councilwoman will tell you, they park uh, uh, anywhere they can in the neighborhood because there's nowhere, there's not even a pay to park uh, parking facility nearby. So there's literally no parking at all. So right. that's why that, we're utilizing the airs, and that's how we have excess, that's why we have excess parking. Okay, and, and just to follow up to that is, um, how will the parking be managed on site uh, to reduce the street congestion? Uh, well, we don't anticipate that. The street, the, the parking, the, this site, uh, you know, the zoning rationale part of it is that it's, it's a fantastic location. It's, it's perfect for a rezoning like this because it's up against the service road of the Grand Central Parkway. So all the vehicles and all the cars and everything is coming, being oriented through the Grand Central Parkway service road, which right now serves as basically in a, a, an ancillary route to the Grand Central Parkway. Traffic moves quite fast on it. It's not a quiet well. street. So the idea is that all the parking, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yes? No, no, I'm just saying that it doesn't move that, that quickly. Oh, uh, not, yeah, not during rush hour. Out of this, and I'm asking this question given the fact that come, come three o'clock, school lets out, it's all backed up. And so I'm just trying to figure out how to, how is this gonna be managed so that it doesn't increase uh, a couple of different ways, and I could take you through and show you on the, uh, in plan format. We've created, the first thing is, uh, 
we don't believe we're going to draw that much traffic to the site, especially during the times you just specified. Uh, the market rate tower that will be built, we'd imagine, will be attracting more of a younger demographic, young families uh, that will be at work during the daytime hours. Uh, the senior housing, uh, we will have a shuttle bus from the senior housing that will run up to Queens Boulevard and up to the subways, uh, which we would imagine most of the people are going to take advantage of that are seniors. Uh, there is a lot of shopping, local shopping. Uh, with respect to the site plan that's been proposed and shown to you, uh, this is giving you the elevation from the Grand Central Parkway Service Road. Down at the bottom, where I'm going to take in a second in plan form, is a driveway that uh, hopefully Brian put it on a site plan, if I could find it here. There it is. Uh, well, did I just go past it? I went past it, didn't I? I blinked and went past it. The computer's a little slower than me. I apologize. Or I'm faster than the computer, one or the other. Here we go. So what this is showing you uh, is the off-street loading area where uh, people that live within the building uh, will be able to pull up onto a driveway uh, once they're dropped off and you know, their, their guests or whoever's being dropped off is dropped off. Uh, the car can get back onto the, the roadway. Uh, so when you have people being dropped off, uh, they're not double parking within the roadway and deliveries and the like. If somebody gets a UPS or an Amazon delivery or a FedEx or whatever, uh, they can, uh, the trucks can pull up there to make the deliveries. They won't be blocked from the service road. Uh, and then there's, of course, ample parking within the parking garage. It's 180 self-park right now. There is room to make it a valet. But the, I'm giving you that information because, as you know, as a self-park, there's a lot of circulation room, which means when cars pull in, there's plenty of room for a car to come in. They're not going to pull into the garage and be stopped by other cars in the garage before they get in. Uh, so I think all of that will, should help address the concerns that you raised. Okay, thank you. And just the last one, is, is there a tenant that's been identified for the ambulatory medical facility yet, or no? No, there's been no tenant identified for that space, uh, but I'm glad you mentioned has there been somebody identified, because I failed to mention that 32BJ, to switch gears a little bit, has been uh, selected and there's been an agreement entered into uh, for them to provide building services within the building when it is constructed. Switching Sorry. gears. Switching gears. Yeah. Um, is there an MIH administrator? There is no MIH administrator in place right now. There are two or three that we are talking to right now. That all loops into the situation I was speaking to when you were alluding to a minute ago as far as to the affordability levels and what the final program that's going to be in place that's going to cause all this to occur. Uh, once that's nailed down and, and signed up, then we could uh, give more assurances. But there have been, uh, I believe, a lot of conversations with folks uh, that, are, that are involved in this uh, with well-known, respected persons that are uh, involved in this industry of senior housing, affordable senior housing. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Let me turn it over to Councilmember Kozlov. I just want to say, and I've said this to the, many, many times, I would like to see a shovel in the ground before I leave office. We're, we're more anxious than you are. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a I've never had a council member ever before uh, dare dare me to have my client race them to dig. Uh, my client is anxious to dig, so we we hope we can satisfy you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank today. you for your time. Uh, I am going to call up the uh, next panelist, uh, Vinny uh, Stiletto from uh, 32BJ. Good morning, Chair Moyer and members of the subcommittee. My name is Vinny Stellato. I work as a doorman at North Shore Towers and have been a member of 32BJ for about three years now. I'm here today on behalf of my union, which represents over 80,000 people who clean and maintain buildings throughout New York City. Like many New York workers, we are concerned about the rising cost of housing in our neighborhoods and city. We are here today to ensure that, that the community uses all of the tools at its disposal so that the people who live and work in Queens can afford to remain and live with dignity. As you know, we believe that in order to create more equitable New York, developers 
should commit to providing prevailing wage building service jobs that give workers mobility and security. Auburge Grand Central LLC, an affiliate of Jasper Venture Group, has made a credible commitment to providing prevailing wage building service jobs once this project is completed. Before it closed, Parkway Hospital was an important source of economic opportunity, and both the local community board and borough president Katz have expressed a desire to see the proposed development at this site give workers a path to mobility. We are happy that Jasper Venture Group has committed to prevailing wage jobs and will bring much needed affordable senior housing to this district. We respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, so are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, we'll take a brief pause for uh, one second. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next public hearing is on LUs 362 through 365, the uh, 809 Atlantic Avenue rezoning for property in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing uh, R7A C24 district to an R9 C25 and R6A district, as well as a related zoning text amendment establishing a mandatory inclusionary housing area and a special permit pursuant to section 
2.711 of the zoning resolution uh, to modify various bulk regulations and a special permit pursuant to section 74.533 of the zoning resolution uh, to waive residential parking requirements. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of two new mixed-use buildings on property located on the north side of Atlantic Avenue between Vanderbilt and Clinton Avenues. The proposed building would be four stories and 29 stories in height uh, with approximately uh, 204,000 uh, square uh, feet of residential floor area and 33 thousand square feet of commercial floor area and the project would also allow the restoration of the landmark church of St. Luke and St. Matthew. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and uh, um, so I will now call up uh, Dan Eagers uh, Deidre Carson, uh, Morris uh, Hajmi, and uh, Shah Dinor. Yeah. And we have Al uh, Wiltshire. 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 Sorry. So I would now ask the council to please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, uh, and that you will answer all questions truthfully, and please state your name in your response? I do, Dan Eggers. I do, Shah Dinoir. I do, Morris Ajmi. I do, Al Wiltshire. I do, Deirdre Carson. You may begin when you're ready. Sure. How do I access the PowerPoint? This is, I think this is the last presentation. I think we just have to escape out of that one. Escape out. Good now afternoon, uh, Chair Moya, Madam Majority Leader, Dan Eggers from Greenberg Trarg. I'm an attorney representing 550 Clinton Partners LLC and 539 Vanderbilt Partners LLC, prospective developers of two new buildings along the north side of Atlantic Avenue between Clinton and Vanderbilt Avenues. I'm joined by architect Morris Ajmi, who will speak shortly. I'm also joined to answer questions you may have by my colleague Deirdre Carson, Shah Dinor representing the developer, and Al Wiltshire, who will shortly read a statement from the Reverend Andrew Durbridge, priest in charge of the St. Luke and St. Matthew Church, who will explain to you why this project is so important to the church. Alex Lieber from AKRF is also here. The development site occupies the entire north frontage of Atlantic Avenue between Clinton and Vanderbilt Avenues. The site is immediately to the east of 470 Vanderbilt, which is in a C63A district having R9 equivalent floor area ratio, and diagonally across from the intersection of Atlantic and Vanderbilt from the eastern end of Pacific Park. Here are some site photos. The site was a non-conforming gas station and auto and car wash, which is now vacated. The site is down the street from the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew, which is one of the most architecturally significant uh, church structures in Brooklyn dating from the 19th century. Today, the site lies in an R7A district mapped to a depth of 100 feet from Atlantic Avenue and 80 feet from Vanderbilt Avenue. The portion within 100 feet of Atlantic is in a C24 commercial overlay. Within this district, which is in an inclusionary housing designated area, the maximum permitted FAR is 4.6 if low income housing is provided in 20% of the residential floor area. The proposed development would contain a total of approximately 235,000 square feet of floor area, of which approximately 
35,000 square feet would be commercial and the rest residential. Three primary actions are before you. The first major action would rezone the development site to an R9 district subject to a C25 commercial overlay. The rezoning would increase the maximum permitted FAR on the development site to 8, allowing the construction of an additional 3.4 FAR of residential floor area and the application of mandatory inclusionary housing to the residential floor area generated by the upzone development site. This would result in an approximately 20,000 square, square foot increase in the floor area required to be maintained permanently in affordable housing units and as proposed would ensure that the affordable housing would be entirely on site. 30% of the residential floor area generated solely by the footprint of the development site, or approximately 40,000 square feet, would be inclusionary housing floor area provided under the MIH program. Overall, 20% of the residential floor area developed in the project would be affordable under MIH. The buildings would have approximately 284 dwelling units, of which at least 87 are anticipated to be affordable under MIH. An additional 28 units would be affordable under the Affordable New York program for a total of 85 affordable units in the project. The second major action is a special permit for Section 74711. The special permit would allow the modification of several bulk regulations, but the most important is the regulation that prohibits the transfer of floor area across zoning district boundaries from districts that have different maximum base FARs for a particular use. Um, in this case, the special permit would allow all the unused floor area from the church, which is approximately 60,000 square feet, to be transferred from the R7A and the R6A districts in which the church is located to the development site. Also, mostly due to the irregular shape of the development site, to accommodate the buildings proposed, the applicant seeks a number of other bulk waivers which are enumerated on the slide here. Finally, the applicant is seeking relief from the obligation to provide um, off-street residential accessory parking through a special permit under Section 74533. This special permit was created as part of ZQA and applies in transit zones in which the site is located. In exchange for allowing the floor area transfer, the developer would fund a comprehensive <coughs> facade restoration of the church. Morris Ajmi will tell you a little more about that and then introduce the new buildings to you. Good morning. Um, I'm Morris Ajmi. I'm the architect for the project. Um, here's a view looking um, northwest on Vanderbilt and you can see the proposed structure with a, a tower on a base. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about the overall design but in uh, general we masked the bulk of the site on Vanderbilt which is a uh, catty corner uh, to uh, Pacific Park which has a building uh, that is just slightly taller than what we're proposing and we've made some moves architecturally to both reveal uh, the steeple as well as address the lower scale on Clinton, which I'll show you in a second. Um, here we see the overall site um, looking southwest. Uh, the church is in the foreground indicated uh, with the flag above uh, and the development site in orange. Uh, and then the Pacific uh, Park site that I mentioned is on the other side of Atlantic. Um, <coughs> First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the restoration work. Uh, you see this image of the church uh, today. Uh, it was built in uh, 1888 to 1891, uh, and there was a, a significant fire in uh, 1914 when the center portion of the church was rebuilt. There was also a, f a fire in 2012 uh, during the Occupy Sandy, uh, 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 when they were occupying the site. There was a fire set there, uh, so there was some further damage. Uh, and although this photograph of the church looks uh, very uh, beautiful, uh, it is in uh, need of significant repairs, which I'll show you in more detail now. Uh, here's a, a diagram. All of those colored uh, areas are uh, indicating specific work that will be um, uh, uh, done to the structure. Um, the basic cleaning uh, will happen, but all the way to replacement and removal of poor 
um, patches that occurred previously. Uh, there's a work to the stained glass frame, um, limestone, brownstone repair, and replacement all around, along the base uh, of the building. There's a tremendous amount of damage in the steeple and the belfry, uh, and that will have a significant replacement. Uh, it is structurally sound, but in very, very poor condition, which I'll show you. Um, and there's also uh, some slate and copper uh, uh, work on the roof. Uh, here you see some of the images, and you can see that the stone is spalling. Uh, there were a number of poor uh, patches made, uh, which caused further damage, and so the goal would be to put this into first class um, uh, condition, which Landmarks has um, approved. Uh, we had very extensive drawings uh, that were presented to them. Uh, here you can see some of the damage in the belfry. Uh, stone is uh, falling. Uh, bricks are uh, in poor state. Support is, uh, is, is also um, questionable. Um, more views of that belfry. Uh, the rear of the building is going to have um, some work, uh, waterproofing and drainage, uh, which will prevent further damage from occurring. Uh, you can see that water actually has infiltrated the building uh, and it is in poor uh, condition. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the new project now. And um, uh, we see the site uh, indicated uh, on the corner of uh, Vanderbilt, uh, spanning between Vanderbilt and Clinton on Atlantic. There's a 29-story tower, the lower four-story base, uh, and um, we are doing some uh, articulation of that of the base of the tower as well as the podium. Um, here's two images: the top one from 1927 and the lower one from 1940, showing the prominence of the steeple uh, in the neighborhood. And this is one of the considerations uh, that we felt, felt was important. Here's a view looking uh, northwest on Vanderbilt. Uh, you can see the proposed building at Pacific Park on the left, and uh, you notice the steeple uh, in approximately the center of that image. Um, we're just showing what would be an as of right structure which would rise to 95 feet and would block uh, the views from the steeple from many locations. Uh, this is our proposed building. Uh, you can see that we twist the base of that tower to uh, create more uh, viewing space for the steeple and lower the base um, significantly so that it would be visible. And then on the corner of Atlantic and Clinton, uh, this is the existing condition, uh, and then the proposed building also with a twist on the side, uh, allowing for greater visibility and uh, moving the back of that portion of the building to be more or less in line with the townhouses that are adjacent on the block. Um, here's an elevation showing the visibility. Um, this is a series of uh, drawings showing the design. We're using a buff colored uh, precast that has, uh, art uh, has uh, aggregate uh, in the colors that you see on the church, the limestone, the brownstone, uh, et cetera. Um, here's a, a section showing how the, the uh, pilasters are attenuated uh, on the higher portion of the building. The base, which will have multiple uh, entry points on Atlantic. And um, here's a plan, and just to show you the entrances. There are two entrances. The entrance to the tower uh, is on Vanderbilt for the residents, uh, and on um, uh, Clinton uh, for the lower portion, and then multiple entry points for the retail. And there's a view uh, coming back to the view. Thank you. And now, Al, I turn to Al to read a statement from the Reverend Durbage. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Al Wiltshire. I'm the former, vest former senior warden of the vestry. The vestry is the governing body of the parish. Uh, the letter is from our, our rector, Andrew Durbridge, who was unable to make it this morning because today is Ash Wednesday, and he has priestly duties that he has to perform. The matter before you today is of critical importance to the ongoing viability of the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew in Brooklyn. Our church has been serving the people of Clinton Hill and surrounds for 180 years and seeks to continue to do so. The current building is over 130 years old and is an important landmark in the area, both physically and spiritually. The cost to maintain the building of this magnitude and beauty is beyond the congregation means. 
It costs $100,000 a year just to insure the building. All religious religions are experiencing declining congregation and reduced revenue. We are no different. We do have great hopes for our future through by, <coughs> excuse me, through by providing a spiritual home for our congregation and the many new residents that are moving into the new apartment buildings on our doorstep. The sale of our transferable development rights is supported by all members of the church and the trustees and bishop of the diocese. My other role with the diocese is that of real estate manager, and I can attest to the critical need for us to use the special permit process to release funds for much needed maintenance and the creation of a long thing, <clears throat> excuse me, long-term maintenance endowment of our oldest churches. The value, the full value of the TDR sale, as contemplated by the current design and contract with Hope Street, is $9.0 million. 50% of the sale value is allocated to the facade restoration pro project that has been approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. After closing costs, we are allocated $1.2 million for much needed interior restoration of the building to make them ADA compliant and functionally suitable for the ministry needs of the congregation. The balance of the sales proceeds will be invested by the trustees as a long-term endowment to meet the obligations we are taking by entering into a covenant with Landmarks to maintain the building in first-class condition. This is not something we did lightly, as it is onerous obligation to saddle future generations of church members. The, church abilities, the church's ability to realize the full contract price from the sale is therefore critical to its ability to make these essential investments in the church's future. The contract provides, however, that the contract price will be reduced if any of the floor area transfers from the church is subject to the inclusionary housing program. Jeff Garrison from Hope Street, our development partner, has guaranteed in writing to, to us that Hope Street will cover the full cost of any overruns of the course of the first phase of the LPC land, approved work beyond $4.5 we are very appreciative of Jeff's offer as these types of projects are highly risky. We respectfully urge all council members to support this project. Not only will it guarantee the future use of this important congregation and building, but it will also permit the development of Jeff's project site with new affordable housing for the area. I give thanks for your time and work you do for the city and thank you on behalf of our congregation for approving this matter. God's blessing, the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew, Brooklyn, Andrew Durbridge, priest in charge. Thank you. For the reasons you've heard, we respectfully request your approval of the actions and we welcome any questions. Great. Um, I'll turn it over now to Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you. So glad that you all are here. Thank you, Dr. Wiltshire, for your testimony. I appreciate the way you urge and thank for our approval all in the same sentence. <laughs> Very appreciated. Um, wanted to jump into a few questions about how the deal was constructed between the church and the developer. Um, and I guess you all can decide who's best equipped to answer that question. Can you explain how the relationship between the church and the developer first began? Um, did the church seek buyers for air rights or did the developer approach the church? Want me to answer that? Yeah. yeah. No, the, the church, uh, because of the condition of the church, et cetera, we advertise that our air rights were up for sale and we sought out the developer. They did not approach us. We were looking for a developer to purchase our air rights. Interesting. How many square feet of development rights are being sold? It's approximately 60,000 square feet from the church and a few additional thousand square feet from the intervening parcels, which are included as part of the zoning lot because 10 feet of linear contiguity is required to form a zoning lot. And in order to form a chain to the church, those sites are included as part of the zoning lot. But there's not many development rights available on those parcels. 
And how was the value of these air rights approached or calculated? Um, we're paying, in a sense, everybody the same price per square foot for their rights. Um, and if, you know, 60,000 square feet, it's $9 million, it's $150 a foot. And, and, and there was an appraisal done uh, for the rate that we would be paid for the air rights. Just to elaborate a little on that, the sale of development rights in a transaction of this kind requires approval not only by the governing body of the church, but also by the courts and by um, the attorney general's office. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of eyes looking at it. And in order to get it approved by all of those bodies, uh, uh, the kind of formal appraisal process that was gone through in this particular instance had to be performed. So the completion of those approval processes are actually conditions to our obligations to close with the church. So the 800-pound gorilla in the room on this project is really the purchasing of the air rights from the church, but in your new development, those air rights will not be subjected to the MIH plan. If the sale or the transfer of the air rights meant on your development side that it would be subjected to the MIH affordable housing program, would you have walked away from this project if you would have known that the transfer of those units would also have to be subjected to MIH? Would that have been a deal breaker for you or would you have continued to move forward? It's a very difficult question to answer without properly evaluating the economics. It definitely wouldn't have been the same building that we would be building, and we, it would probably force us back to the drawing board in one sense or another. Can you state again how much the square footage of development rights is being transferred from the church and how much from the additional mid-block properties? So it's approximately 60,000 square feet from the church and about another 6,000 or so from the intervening parcels. So let me back up for a second. Let me ask you this question on the development side. Of the time, is this your first project of this scale in this community? Uh, we just finished the building in Borum Hill, uh, not, not as large. So this would be our first uh, project of this size in this community. Have you had an opportunity to familiarize yourself with this community? Yes, uh, we're very familiar with the community, and actually, I personally live in Carroll Gardens, not too far from there, so my kids go to public school, I'm very familiar with the area and the community. And maybe it's a council thing, but we're super territorial about our neighborhoods. <laughs> so Carroll Gardens is kind of like Oklahoma. Um, not in terms of its feel, but in terms of geographically how we could see something like that. What have you gotten to know about this community? How would you describe the community of Clinton Hill, Fort Greene? How would you describe that community? And how would you describe um, its challenges? What are the things that are challenging that community? And what are the things that are its benefits? Well, in my personal opinion, I think the community is, uh, is a very vibrant community. Again, comparing it to my little Oklahoma, uh, I, see, I see the restaurants, I see the nightlife, I see the bars there, and there certainly seem to be a lot of them, and they're certainly busier than in my neighborhood. So it certainly seems to be a destination uh, for a lot of people not just living in the community. <clears throat> Being anchored by two parks, I consider, you know, Prospect Park not too far away from there, bike ride-wise. It's a, obviously a wonderful amenity. And, and I think... Personally, I feel like this community has a substantial advantage over downtown Brooklyn, uh, the busy area of downtown Brooklyn, because it really offers the best of both worlds. It offers, you know, the low rise, the charming neighborhoods, but it also offers, um, you know, higher density amenities uh, like the Barclays Center, like, you know, Atlantic Terminal, as well as everything that's coming into Pacific Park. So I almost think it's, it's one of the best neighborhoods uh, in Brooklyn these days because it, it really manages to very uh, nicely combine the balance of the low rises, the beautiful mansions of Clinton and Vanderbilt, as well as some of the busyness and some of the 
uh, you know, facilities that are offered in a, in a more dense area. I could see you could easily write the marketing ad for this building with no problem. Now let me ask you this question, what do you see as the challenges? Where are the areas or the issues that are confronting this community? So I think the challenges, in my opinion, are probably not, are a little bit further out on Atlantic Avenue. I think there's, there has to be a little bit more of a, you know, eliminating some of the non-conforming use, which I think it's non-conforming. I think the overall, you know, it's amazing to me how once you, you know, travel from Atlantic Avenue, um, going north, how just the scenery and the aesthetics completely change. So I personally think that this community uh, needs to see higher caliber of development and like many people in the previous hearing said, good development and something that we could all be proud of. I want to add because we all come to things with a different lens. I think it's important to challenge yourself and, and many other developers to seeing the communities beyond the development and the building. So when you look at a neighborhood like this, as I drive through, I see the lines continue to expand for the food pantries with people waiting on long lines with carts, um, looking for food options in areas where food has become very unaffordable. We see that there are and continue to be challenges in terms of safety in our community and how safe people feel in our community. Um, we have overcrowding in our schools, and many of our schools lack after-school programs um, and proper support to be able to do so. Many of the students, um, and, it, and it, the numbers vary in terms of school and academic performance, are still not uh, performing at the higher levels of the echelons as far as um, a lot of the testing and, and understanding where the children uh, reside. We have in the 35th district, five NYCHA developments that are still very challenged with employment. So I could go on and on in terms of uh, a lot of the challenges that the community um, is experiencing, but one of the things that I wanna see is that I want to see development also be a solution or an answer to many of the challenges so that when development is happening in our communities, people see that as an opportunity um, and, a, and a solution to solve many of the challenges. And it's, it's very easy, I would imagine, coming into a, a district and seeing the lights, camera, and action of the Barclays and the institutions and many of those things. But it's very easy to see that we have homeless shelters in our district, we have food pantry lines that are bursting at the seams, we have schools that are bursting at the seams with the need for after school programming and many of those things. So I, I, want the, I, I certainly want that to be at the forefront of how you all continue to do your discussions um, and negotiations. And, and leading to that, which is the hugest issue in our district, is the housing uh, crisis that's impacting so many. So this application proposes a MIH option two 30% at an average of 80 AMI. Why did you select to propose option two instead of the deeper affordability of option one? 25% at an average of 60 AMI, including 10% at 40 AMI. So can you explain to me um, the choice of option two? Sure. So option, option two, as you know, is linked to a higher percentage of affordable floor area, 30% as opposed to 25%. And in this situation, when applied to the upzoned residential floor area, if only 25% of that was required to be affordable under MIH, there would only be a total of about 17% affordable um, units in the project. And as you know, one of the actions here is a waiver of the required residential parking under a special permit. And one of the requirements of that special permit is that 20% of the units in the development be affordable. And the way the statute is written and the way of the affordability is defined, that is keyed to the MIH units. So we had requested, as part of the application, the higher percentage of affordability under MIH in option two, 30%. We, we've heard um, your concerns and that of the community board about providing deeper levels of affordability and 
our client is reviewing um, various blends uh, that could provide deeper levels, for instance, 65 or 75% or on the MIH units. And we're looking forward to having a continuing conversation with you to find a solution that makes economic sense for the project and addresses your concerns and that of the community. I have a lot of solutions. <laughs> what kind of retail tenants do you anticipate locating in this development? Well, ideally, we'd like to be able to uh, secure, you know, community-based retail tenant, local small business owners. Uh, we have the ability to, you know, subdivide the retail space and also include, the va include vertical access from the retail level to the basement. So ideally it's, it's, it's uh, operators that are either new or already operating in the area, but from the community itself. I want to bring your attention to the fact that I graduated from Brooklyn Technical High School in 1993. And during that particular time, Fulton Street, which is really a stone throws away from that development, Fulton Street was known as the largest uh, strip for African-American owned businesses anywhere in New York State. And over the course of years and through uh, the gentrification that happened to Brooklyn, a lot of those businesses have been displaced and continue to be displaced. And so when you are looking at your commercial and retail options, I think it's important to um, have a focus on many of those businesses that have been displaced or are having challenges on Fulton Street because if we do not become intentional about recognizing that the only reason why uh, this particular parcel of land is attractive now are because local businesses um, and many individuals, many African-American owned businesses made that particular neighborhood and community a thriving place for people to live um, and to work and to do business, but have never really benefited from the growth and the development that's happening in Brooklyn. So I, I would like for you to also continue to um, we focus your energy into the people of the community and the stories of the community so that you can have um, a further breadth because it's, it's very easy to kind of see what are the retail chains in Manhattan that are thriving and to bring those to Brooklyn and rebrand them as Brooklyn-based companies, but there, there are some really special, interesting, and dynamic businesses that are doing a great job right here. So I wanted to um, push that to you as well. Um, so MB, MWBE, local hiring and prevailing wage, can you describe your plans for securing MWBE and locally based contractors and subcontractors to participate in this development? It is of the utmost importance to me that the work site be reflective of the local community and how do you plan to achieve that? So um, I believe there was already an initial uh, meeting uh, with the Department of uh, Small Small Businesses in uh, you know in the city, and we also uh, started a dialogue with uh, Bear Team Consulting uh, to be able to efficiently identify um, these firms from WMB who would be able to participate in the project. On your last project in Borham Hill, what, did you use that same firm? No, on that one we did not. Did you use any firm to do that sort of work? You know what, on that one I was less involved with the minutiae of the construction, so I, I can't answer that, you know, with certainty. Okay. I'm going to need I you to be way more involved on this one. If I may, Councilwoman? Yes. Uh, at, at your direction, we first met uh, Zash's partner, uh, Jeff Gershon. We've met with uh, Janelle Doris, the director of the minority women and WNBA, WNBA yeah. whatever. Uh, we met with, with him once, and the two of them have been in contact, and we're supposed, <coughs> excuse me, we're supposed to have additional meetings with him, but Jeff has agreed to work with Janelle and his program on this project. That's an important element, because we talk a lot about MWBEs, but the numbers aren't moving in terms of what our goals are, so it's gonna be important to have a written, documented plan for what your MWBE and local hiring plans are going to be. And wanted to ask you, uh, moving forward, will 
future property service and maintenance workers at the completed development be paid prevailing wage? Yes, they will. We, uh, we entered into uh, an agreement with 32 BJ. Good to hear it. Um, and sustainability and resiliency. What sustainability and green building features are proposed for this development? Uh, we hope to achieve uh, LEED Silver certification and what that exactly entails. I'm sure Morris could. There are green and blue roof um, uh, techniques that we're using on the project, as well as high performance glass and uh, and and very efficient HVAC systems. Okay. Well, I don't have any further questions at this time. I, I just want to um, reiterate the points that have been made here today and, the, and they really all come down basic to a basic point of getting to know the people of the community um, and getting to understand uh, the stories of the community and um, what has made Brooklyn, New York what it is today, particularly the Clinton Hill, Fort Greene community. I'll turn it back to Chair Moya if he has any additional questions and thank you for the time. Thank you, Majority Leader Combo. Uh, no, uh, we are good on questions, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, your thoughtfulness in, in, in this project. Uh, thank you to the panel uh, for your testimony today. I will be calling the next panel. Um, uh, oh. Chair, Chair Moya, I believe yep. my client has Just one, one clarification. clarification for the uh, in addition to the meeting with the <clears throat> WMB, we did also engage with Ed Brown. Uh, I believe I mentioned that, but I think I mentioned it too quickly, from Team Brown for consulting to actually be able to, uh, you know, work through the process of identifying these parties more efficiently. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, we will be calling up Duke uh, Lambert and Liddell York. You can just state your name and you can begin. Hey, good evening. Um, it's good to be here. Good to see you guys again. Um, I'm Liddell York. Um, to Chair, Mo Chair Moyer and committees, to the members of the subcommittee, my name is Liddell York. I am security officer and, and security officer and have been a member of 32BJ for the past two years. I'm here on behalf of my union as a Brooklyn resident to share our support for the proposed rezoning and development of 809 Atlantic Avenue, which is being perceived by affiliates of Hope Street Capital. As you know, 32 BJ represents more than 80,000 property service workers in New York City. Our members clean and maintain buildings like these two proposed. We believe that responsible development means good jobs that pay prevailing wages for the local community. We are happy to report that Hope Street Capital has made this commitment. We look forward to working with and we look forward to working with them. We believe that the developers, developers' commitment to good jobs, building restoration, and a home for a local theater company provides benefits to the community, and we are happy to support this project. For these reasons, we, respect, we respectfully urge you to approve this project. And um, I am also want to say um, what the young lady was um, saying before, making a, making a point, what's your name? Um, Laura yeah, Laura Cumbo. Um, I think they're going to be committed to um, doing a broader thing in the community, not just for like the, so let's say the upper class part of the district, the, like the smaller part of the district too, like the um, shelters, the, um, the lower income. Like I think they're going to look out for that too, because that's important too, getting known like, like that part of the community and stuff, you know. And when they do that, like they're doing the prevailing way things and working with 32 BJ, because I'm, I'm, I'm from like the lower part of the community, would you would say, you know, because like, it's all one district, but it's like basically almost two cities in one district, if you know what I can mean, through the gentrification and stuff, like the tell two cities, almost. But I, I believe with Hope Street Capital, they're gonna um, not just go for the higher part, the lower part too, because that'd be important. So that's why I respectfully urge y'all. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad you feel so confident. Um, so we look forward to working with them on that. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, good day. <clears throat> My name is Duke Lambert. I'm a member of the St. Luke and St. Matthew Parish. 
and uh, you should turn the timer off because I'm the only one, so I'm going to wax eloquent all day. So um, <clears throat> I'm here really with total support for this project. What we have earmarked, I'm a mem by the way, I'm a member of the vestry in the church. Uh, what we have earmarked is that there is a massive amount of outreach that the church can do in the community. It's not just the buildings that are being proposed, but there are other are, um, sections of construction going on in the area. And we, as a, as, a, as a religious organization, can do much for the community. And this project and the finances that will come to us because of it will be a massive amount of help that will allow us to go out into the community and minister to the community. The community is changing and we have to change with it. And the only way we can change with it is if we have the resources to change, to, to effect this change. If this project doesn't go through, there isn't much we can do in the community. If this project goes through, there is a tremendous amount of good that St. Luke and St. Matthew can do for the community. And I am hoping that you will consider the fact that doing good and doing good effectively for one's community, one's neighborhood, is as important as breathing, as important as being able to say hello to somebody. Because one of the things we want to do is go out into the community and reach and ask them to come in and enhance our spiritual enhancement of the community. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your testimony. That was a very compelling testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you for your words. Are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and uh, it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes uh, today's meeting and I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, uh, council and land use staff uh, for all their uh, hard work uh, that they do and this meeting is hereby adjourned.